agenda is the executive director's report. Susan Barrett. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Happy 2020, everybody. The legislative session is, it has uh, returned. I feel like I've been in that building for six months. It's only been two days. They've uh, gotten things going very quickly. So um, thank you all for coming today. I, I do have a few announcements, very brief. Um, our schedule for January is up on our uh, website. Please take a look at it. We have a very busy month ahead. Um, we're obviously hearing from the Rural Healthcare Task Force today. Um, and next week, we have a panel discussion um, focused on primary care. And I actually uh, know that those participants on that primary care panel have been involved in this process at the Rural Health Care Task Force and are actually building off of the recommendations for their discussion next week. So that should be interesting. Um, I think that's all I have to report, only that uh, next um, Wednesday also is January 15th and we have several reports due to the legislature, uh, most notably our annual report. And so that will be posted on our website when it is completed, which is very soon. And I'll turn that, that this over to you, um, back to you, Mr. Chair, but I know uh, Board Member Lunge will be doing some introductions for this discussion and then may get up, will get up and present to us. So we'll work through those logistics. Okay, did you mm -hmm. want to mention the topic of next week's board meeting? Oh, did I, the, it's a panel discussion on primary care workforce. Did I miss that? I'm sorry. Thank you for reminding me. Okay, the next item on the agenda are the minutes of Wednesday, December 18th. So moved. Second. It's been moved and seconded to approve the minutes of Wednesday, December 18th, without any additions, deletions, or corrections. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, at this point in time, I will turn it over to Robin. Great, um, and I am going to move over to join my fellow task force members in a moment, but before I do that, I did want to just say a big thank you to several of our staff members who uh, were very much uh, responsible for making sure that we could get this report out. And that includes Abigail, who is our administrative support, both for me and for the task force as a whole. Agatha, who uh, took our minutes and did a lot of research on various topics to help uh, provide that background material and is also responsible for anything pretty in the slide. All the mistakes are mine, but all the pretty <laughs> graphics are hers. Uh, also, Patrick and Lori, as well as uh, board member Lucifer, helped us on the financial component of the report. Toby Howe, who works with Laura Pelosi, did a, a heroic job on the workforce white paper. Uh, and then also we had assistance from several staff members at the Department of Health and, and our staff, uh, Jess Mendizable and, and Donna as well on the inventory. So this really was a group effort um, among the task force, but also from a number of staff members from a number of agencies and departments. So I just wanted to do that thank you first. So um, I am gonna now shift over there. Okay. Well, while you're walking over, Mr. Um, Clark and I, add one other item to my executive director's report. Sure. I want to thank board member Lunge for leading this work over the last, I thought it was three months, but she reminded me it was six started months. in June. <laughs> so thank you very much. You're welcome, thank you. Um, so why don't we just go down the, the row and introduce ourselves. Laura, do you want to start? Sure, Laura Pelosi at MMR. I meet Laura Pelosi at MMR, and I represent uh, on the Rural Health Services Task Force, the Vermont Health Care Association, which is the trade group for long-term care facilities. Good afternoon, Jill Olson. I'm the executive director of the VNAs of Vermont, and I represent at Home Health and Hospice on the task force. Everybody knows me. And hi, the Kessler staff of the Green Mountain Care Board, and I was um, a support role to the task force during their work. Okay, so I'm going to... Uh, Actually, put this in the stand. I'll make sure it's close enough. Can everyone hear me okay? We can. Okay, so we're going to get started. Um, so, before we jump into the slides, I did want to just do a very brief introduction. Uh, the board really started looking at the issue of rural health care issues 
uh, last spring with our panel around hospital closures and some of the national issues that are presenting pressures for uh, hospitals in particular at that panel. But I think the work that we did around that panel has really set the stage for the environment and some of the background information that we're going to provide today. Um, this task force report advances the topic, although it is not that the last stop uh, in the journey around rural health issues. Um, I think that really what the task force is hoping for is that this will uh, be another step in the conversation about potential solutions. Also, the task force members, I just want to say thank you to them because they really diligently worked towards producing a comprehensive look at this issue with a shared goal of advancing shared solutions. And with, you'll see the diversity on the task force in a moment when we get to that slide, but uh, it really, this task force really could have failed in terms of crashing and burning around uh, not being able to come to solutions. And everyone really did a great job of working together to find common, uh, common areas and solutions. All right, I have to point this. Mm -hmm. Okay. You can uh, tell I haven't <laughs> sat over here before. <laughs> um, so just briefly on the table of contents, um, this report, this slide deck is the report that we will submit along with the workforce white paper to the legislature. So we erred on the side of including a broad array of slides to really tell the story and let it stand alone. What we're gonna try and do today is give you the highlights and an overview. So we won't necessarily go in depth on every single slide, otherwise our meeting would be twice as long. Um, and so, so there, I made sort of an executive decision on, in terms of areas where I felt the board in particular had uh, more background that we could more quickly move through materials. With that said, please feel free, Mr. Chair, to slow us down on particular topics if you would like, and um, we're happy to either have you ask questions as we go or to hold them at the end, whatever you prefer. So the, this, is, this slide shows the uh, legislative requirements from Act 26 of last year for the task force. And I just wanna pause for a moment on this charge because it is extremely broad. Uh, and I think one of the areas that we were successfully able to tackle as the task force is finding a way to narrow our focus so that we could actually provide uh, real recommendations uh, in a short period of time with a very broad charge. So we were charged with doing an inventory of the current system of rural healthcare delivery in Vermont, considering how to ensure sustainability of the system, identifying existing barriers and ways to overcome them, and identifying ways to encourage and improve care coordination, and considering potential consequences for the failure of one or more rural hospitals in Vermont. Any one of these topics, quite frankly, could have been the only thing that we spent our summer and fall doing. So uh, it was a broad charge, but I think we, we tackled it well. Great. So this next slide shows the membership of the committee, and several of the members are in the, in the audience today, and thank you for joining us. Um, Act 26 set up the task force to have 14 members. There's representatives from Human Services, Green Mountain Care Board, Department of Health, Healthcare Advocate Hospitals, FQHCs, free clinics, independent practices, designated and specialized agencies, mental health, home health, long-term care. And the point of this, of such a, um, um, a broad membership, is because it is addressing health care delivery in rural Vermont, which is more than just one sector alone. Um, the, the style of the meetings were, there were 10 of them, um, and um, first I should say that they elected Robin as the chair pretty much right away. Um, and you're familiar with Robin, several people are familiar with Robin in the room, and she ran those meetings in a way that was formal. So there were formal votes, there were minutes, they were noticed, but they were also collaborative, so that people in the audience that weren't on the task force were um, encouraged to participate and did contribute to the report. Um, also worth noting is that a substantial amount of work was done in subgroups, so outside of those 10 meetings. Um, there were volunteers from the task force to lead subgroups like workforce, Laura led the workforce, there was care coordination, to some extent there was a telehealth um, subgroup, and there were non-task force members on those subgroups, so it was truly a collaborative effort. 
um, the, the group also, some representatives of the group went to other meetings to talk about the work of the task force and um, solicit, solicit comments. So there was regular attendance at the meetings and the public truly really did have a chance to uh, participate outside of just a traditional public comment period. Anything you want to add to that? So the next, the next few slides are really trying to set the context and the environment uh, within which we did our work. And I, these are the slides that I'm actually going to go through rather quickly because they really build off of uh, the panel that the board heard from in last spring. So the, the first area that I really wanted to ground us in is, as, as we know, Vermont is in the middle of the all-pair model agreement with the federal government. And uh, this slide will be familiar to the board members because it's a common slide that we see in our ACO and all pair model regulatory structure to talk about the reason why Vermont was pursuing uh, the all pair model, including the gro cost, cost growth exceeding that of the economy and uh, improvements that we could make in health outcomes or areas where we as a state could do better. I, I would like to start here because uh, I think it's important for us to recognize that when some of the financial sustainability issues started to hit Vermont, we were already part way down this journey. Um, and so it's an important contextual piece to how we would look at solutions to the issues and why we may take different approaches than other areas in the country. Uh, this slide I'm going to skip for us because this really talks about a little more depth about the all pair model. And having just come out of an ACO regulatory uh, process, we really, uh, for this audience, it doesn't need to be covered. So um, as we talked about in the spring, there are several uh, federal and as well as state pressures around healthcare that is looking, which is causing changes in the healthcare landscape nationally. And uh, those really span from some of the areas of focus and changes in the Affordable Care Act in terms of creating market instability. Uh, for rural areas, there is an aging population. Uh, part of that is an aging workforce demographic. There are also Medicare changes at the federal level that are, are causing pressures. And so really, I, I think the takeaway there is that uh, Vermont healthcare providers are not immune from national pressures which have focused on reducing reimbursements and fee-for-service and, and destabilizing the Affordable Care Act. And so in this slide, what we tried to do is just pull out for audiences that are less familiar with some of those national pressures, some examples of uh, different areas that, of change that are occurring at the federal level that are impacting our Vermont providers. Uh, this is built off of a slide that Eric Schell used. I basically took his slide and Vermontized it. So, uh, since we had had a robust discussion about that, I'm not going to go th through the examples with you today. Additionally, um, as the board is well aware, the Center for Medicare and, Me Medicare and Medicaid Innovation is continuing with value-based payments, and that is an environment which is uh, going to remain a national environment into the future. So shifting now to other demographic factors, Rural areas, including Vermont, tend to be older and thus less healthy. So Vermont is one of the most rural states in the nation. We're also the third oldest state, and we are aging at a faster rate than many others, other states. The percentage of Vermonters who are age 65 is growing, while the percentage under the age of 20 is declining. And uh, like most other, other, most other rural areas, our most rural counties in Vermont are older and have poorer health, come, health, poorer health outcomes than the, le the less uh, rural counties. Um, I'll pause here just to say that the task force early on talked about whether we needed to have a definition of rural, and what we decided to do was really not limit geographically um, our look. And the reason we did that is even if you are looking at providers providing services in Chittenden County, which is obviously our most urban county, uh, they are seeing people who uh, come from the rural counties, particularly uh, our academic medical center. is an academic medical center for rural areas as well as urban areas. So we decided specifically not to limit our geographic look. 
Another piece of background is to think about how Vermonters are covered because the coverage components uh, do impact on um, reimbursements and other factors, um, what coverage is provided and that kind of thing that impact on sustainability issues. So what this slide provides as background is basically since 2000, uh, the year 2000, the proportion of Vermonters who are covered by our public programs, Medicare and Medicaid, has increased, our ins uninsured rate has decreased, and commercial insurance market has decreased slightly as well. That's been the trend. And so that's really just meant as some background in thinking through um, some of what we discussed later in the report. So this is a complicated slide <laughs> that is uh, that is trying to tell a story about uh, a piece of the report that uh, we were hoping to make more robust. So what we attempted to do as a task force was collect key financial performance indicators uh, from the entities that collect financial information today. And we, we did get a lot of information, but we didn't get information in such a way that we really could do an entity or sector level analysis of financial sustainability. So uh, this slide really explains that there's a lot of data that currently is collected from providers. It goes to different agencies. Many providers report to more than one agency, but the purpose of the, of the reporting is often not a financial assessment or, uh, and in most cases, is not focused on financial sustainability in the sense that even if the agency is doing an assessment, they may or may not have a lever to to then solve an issue. Um, and so uh, I'm gonna turn it over to Agatha to explain the slide because it is a complicated slide, but that's really the purpose of why we wanted to show this. Because we thought it was important to show that there is a lot of data, but that data is not really looking at what we were trying to look at. So it was of limited usefulness. Yeah, thank you. So I won't go through the details, I'll just basically give you some shortcuts on how to use this slide. So the, the top parts, the dark blue bo boxes, are the agencies that are collecting the information. Um, in addition to those top four boxes on the top are these two bars that span the length of the diagram on the bottom, um, which is DIVA and the federal government. The reason why DIVA and the federal government, who are agencies that are collecting data, are on the bottom is because so many of the healthcare sectors that are represented here are reporting directly to DIVA and the federal government. So for simplification purposes, we drop those two collecting agencies down to the bottom. Um, and then right here are the healthcare sectors that very much mirror the membership of the committee. And you'll hear, them, you'll hear us refer to these sectors throughout the report. Um, the, the lines that are drawn with a dotted line, um, so as not to sort of misinterpret this as an organizational chart, but this is a reporting chain, um, show how the, how the entities are reporting to these agencies. And then the key on the bottom shows for what purpose the, um, the data that's being collected is used for. So like Robin said, if it's one that looks like a piggy bank, um, that's a financial assessment. Whether or not they're actually assessing the financial health or sustainability of the institution is another question, but they are collecting the data for, um, for purposes of financial assessment. If there's a dollar sign, it's for reimbursement and rate setting purposes. And the one that looks like a chart is for key performance indicators, which may or may not be financial or quality. Um, and then one other note for simplif simplification purposes, um, independent providers and FQHCs on the right-hand side. Like I said, there are lots of sectors that are reporting to DIVA and the federal government, but those are the two that we highlighted their relationship with those two entities. The only other thing I would add is that if um, the symbol is in the chain up higher up, it means it does apply to all the entities. And we did that just for readability. There we go. Um, so one other piece of background um, that we looked at early on was a report by the Bipartisan Policy Center, which is uh, a center which was looking at rural health care at the national level. And uh, I just pulled out their priority areas and recommendations as a point of reference. And you will see when Agatha goes over our, the task force priorities that there's good alignment uh, between what our task force focused on and what this national 
bipartisan policy center report focuses on. And those are build and retain the rural workforce, expand telemedicine services, create appropriate payment models and value-based care programs that account for low patient volumes and a reliance on Medicare and Medicaid, and allow rural communities to adjust their own healthcare services to better fit the community's needs. Uh, and a lot of the recommendations in that area focused on federal designations, which may require certain types of services to be offered in order to maintain that uh, designation. So an example of that would be the critical access hospital designation. Um, so we, I looked at this report really basically to get a sense of um, what was going on at the national level and to help us think about any areas that maybe we as a task force hadn't independently identified, but we were in good alignment. This is the pointer. <laughs> So then in terms of the task force, the Rural Health Services Task Force, as Robin said, um, there was a, a need to narrow the focus of that large legislative charge. Um, and so the task force did this by early on doing a priority setting exercise, where each member of the task force came to one of the first few meetings with a list of what their priorities were for their healthcare sector, what the issues were, but also what some potential solutions to those issues were. And from there, they found common, commonalities, common grounds, and prioritized. So of all the issues that were identified, and there were several, um, the group limited themselves, their work to workforce, care management, which was actually one of the requirements of Act 26, and revenue stability. Sort of one topic that touched all of those three that came up in the conversation of potential solutions was telehealth. So the group did decide that they wanted to um, address that issue in their report. Um, the task force in setting those priorities also set some principles for themselves in addressing those priorities. Because they worked for a very short period of time, a relatively short period of time, six months with 14 members for 10 meetings, um, they wanted to stay focused on those three priority groups, including telehealth, and they wanted to work with materials that had already been produced and were consistent with the work they were already doing. So they were looking at what was happening in the nursing home oversight report, or what was happening with the oral health task force, or what was happening in reports that were published previously. So it was really using the materials and the resources that were already at our fingertips. They wanted the recommendations to be inclusive of financial and non-monetary solutions, intending that this report was to be submitted to the legislature, so in order to give the legislature options on the recommendations. And they wanted the solutions or the recommendations to be beneficial to all healthcare sectors. Again, the purpose of a 14-member group that is that diverse is to not just fix one sector or address the recommendation for one sector, but for all the sectors. And I should mention that all of the um, recommendations that are in this report are consensus. If there wasn't consensus on a rec recommendation, then it didn't make it into the report. Anything to add? Uh, the only thing I would add is that you will see uh, later in the deck um, a list of other work groups and reports that we looked at. Um, some of them, there were uh, people brought up a lot of the other reports that are to be submitted next week, so we weren't able to align with absolutely every relevant legislative effort, and there, quite frankly, are quite a number of them, but we did our best. <coughs> so you can't really have a top a discussion on rural health care and delivery in Vermont without talking about some very critical economic barriers to, um, to rural Vermont. Um, in that priority setting exercise that they did, the group did focus on the three workforce care coordination and revenue stability but also spent some time discussing um, these economic barriers that no matter what recommendation is put forward, they will continue to run up against some underlying infrastructure issues that affect all of Vermonters, but particularly in rural areas. Um, so there was discussion around um, transportation, child care, child care, and housing. And these three things not only affect the patient side of the equation, they also affect the provider side of the equation. So the task force, again, early on, recognized these as being beyond the scope of their work, but did want to make mention of them in the report. Okay. So we're going to move into the next section of the report now, which is rural health delivery. It's just a few slides, and we can breeze through them because this is stuff that should look familiar to the Green Mountain Care Board. Um, this slide comes directly from the expenditure analysis. Lori Perry from our office works very hard on this and it's a very valuable resource. 
But the purpose of this slide is to, as, as we're looking at the healthcare sectors, um, long-term care, nursing, hospital, um, this is a resource that was at our fingertips to sort of um, show the scope of each of the sectors. Now, it's not an apples to apples, but it is, it is showing that in 2017, how the $6 billion in expenditures was spent by healthcare sector. Um, this is showing the resident analysis, which shows spending by Vermont residents, regardless of whether or not they got their care in Vermont. And then the next slide, which is still the same $6 billion pie, but it's divided up by um, the provider analysis. So this shows the spending at Vermont providers, regardless of where the patient resides. So it could be from a Vermonter that's out of state. Um, this next slide is the last slide in the section shows um, just three inventory maps. There are several inventory maps that are in the last section of this report, but this is sort of a preview for the inventory, the substantial inventory work that was done predominantly by the Vermont Department of Health. Um, they, and the Department of Health, John Olson was a task force member, worked with some of the staff at the Green Mountain Care Board, just Mendes Bull and Jer uh, Donna Jerry, in putting this together. The maps, the full version of these maps in the back of the report are also supplemented by a narrative that describes the map. Um, so we're not going to go through the inventory section. We can schedule another time to come back if you're interested in that. Um, but just to show that this is a sample of what those um, maps look like. The only thing I would add to that is that we will um, be using the inventory maps as our first basis for HRAP 2020, um, and that we will continue to work with the Department of Health to build on that uh, as well. My turn. So headed on to workforce. Um, this is something that I've spent the last solidly the last two years working on. Um, I started working for the long-term care facilities in 2009, and on my first day on the job, they said to me that my number one priority is to help them deal with their regulatory challenges. And that was consistently the top priority for them until about three years ago, when they said, our single biggest problem is that we can't get staff. What are we gonna do about this? So, the workforce white paper that you see attached to these slides is a really deep dive into a lot of the challenges that we're gonna run through here pretty quickly today. But I would really encourage you to, to take a look at that. There's a ton of research in there and a lot of data that I think is um, really important. And the, the task force and the workforce subcommittee in particular felt pretty strongly about developing that as a way to say to the legislature, this is a priority area particularly in the health uh, the healthcare workforce sector. We have a lot of challenges with workforce across all sectors, manufacturing, construction, you name it. We have a real economic development challenge in this state. But when it comes to healthcare, we need people to take care of people. When we started looking at what are our real challenges and barriers, the aging uh, population stands out as a tremendous, tremendous challenge. When you look at the percentage of our workforce over the age of 60, this presents itself with a, you know, a couple of challenges, right? As our population old, uh, ages, they need greater health care. They have greater health care needs, greater needs for long-term care, and our workforce is aging out. So we see that happening across the various levels of the, of the health care professions. When we look at data from other areas, we see, particularly at the Board of Nursing level, that we have had a significant decrease in the number of licensed um, folks in, the, in the, the nursing professions as well as with our primary care uh, physicians. There are a lot of factors involved with that, um, but the bottom line is that those numbers are steadily decreasing. That shows up when we start looking at what are our vacancy rates and what do we need for staffing. In uh, 2018, the Vermont Talent Pipeline Management Project surveyed all the hospitals, three long-term care facilities, and one <coughs> home health agency to get a sense of what are the nursing needs between 2018 and April of 2020. And they identified 3,900 nursing-related job vacancies. And when I say nursing-related, that's personal care attendants, licensed nurse aides, licensed practical nurses, registered nurses, advanced practice nurses. We knew that that wasn't comprehensive, so the associations got together through this process and did a survey of long-term care facilities, home health agencies, we worked with the designated agencies, 
And you'll see some additional data presented here um, with respect to what we need for primary care, long-term care facilities, home health agencies, um, just in the short term. And when you look at the turnover rates, we have got significant turnover rates. The reason for that is we don't have enough workforce. Folks are working double shifts. Um, we're dealing with a, a, a burnout situation at the provider level at this point. We started talking about what are all the barriers to getting greater numbers of people uh, to enter healthcare for a career. Student debt rises to the top. Um, you'll see in the white paper um, sort of some of the challenges for our institutes of higher education and the increasing tuition rates that we're dealing with. That's laid out there pretty well. Education and credentialing challenges. This really references the challenges with making sure we've got enough clinical nurse educators that are able to educate the qualified applicants that are applying to our nurse education programs right now. Um, you know, our institutes of higher education are enrolling 50 to 60 percent of qualified applicants because they don't have enough clinical nurse faculty. So we need to find a way to increase that pipeline of clinical nurse faculty. Some licensing challenges, which we'll go through in the recommendations, provider burnout, which I've already referenced, aging workforce, which I've already referenced. Really trying to help um, folks outside of Vermont realize that Vermont's a great place to come and live and work and how do we market ourselves um, given the quality of life that we do have. The fact that Vermont really is an innovative place to be a healthcare provider given all of the efforts we have going on. Um, the housing, child care, and transportation issues that Agatha mentioned, this really came out in the context of the workforce discussion. Um, we've got a significant um, number of folks, particularly in the personal care attendant, licensed nurse aide, even our LPNs who really have challenges accessing childcare, particularly if they're single working moms. Um, affordable housing, uh, and that cuts across, you know, affordable and high quality housing when we're trying to attract folks coming into Vermont, we've got an old housing inventory. And then reliable transportation for folks in rural areas to be able to get to work. Um, the trailing spouse, I'm sure you've heard a lot of the challenges around getting uh, folks to move to Vermont when their spouse can't find an appropriate job. And the fact that we're dealing with a tight national, regional, and local labor market. So we have, you know, providers competing across the same pool of potential employers. We're, we're you know, competing with uh, what's happening regionally in New England and then particularly at the physician and nurse level, um, it really is a national market that we're, we're up against. And then one of the things that folks um, you know, felt strongly about was that Medicaid rates tend not to be able to cover the significant wage increases that providers are having to invest in to be competitive. That all translates into extra cost in the system when we're talking about um, a workforce um, shortage. I know the Department of Labor doesn't like me to use the word shortage, but it's the easiest way for me to describe it, but it's technically not accurate. Um, so that results in the, the significant need to utilize traveling uh, temporary and contract employees. And some of the data that we have, um, you'll see down below hospitals, 11 of the 15 hospitals um, reported a spend of over $56 million. Home health and hospice, over $10 million. Skilled nursing facilities, $12 million. And I can tell you, at least on the skilled nursing facility side, and that the data is all in this white paper, over a four-year period just for skilled nursing facilities, it's a 158% increase in what they're spending on traveling nurse staff. As a general rule, facilities are spending twice what they would if they were dealing with um, having employed staff. We wanted to make sure that the board and legislators understood the types of initiatives that providers um, have really been implementing for a number of years to try to deal with the workforce challenge. And as we surveyed um, providers across the various sectors, some best practices really kind of um, were highlighted that many, many of our providers are doing, and you'll see those listed here. We also wanted to um, make sure that we were um, pointing out all of the good work that our legislature and our other non-for-profit partners are doing in this space around loan repayment, scholarships and grants, 
um, and the work that the legislature's done to kind of move the needle over the last few years in helping us address our workforce challenges. So you'll see some of those highlighted here as well. Then we got to what are our recommendations going to be? Um, and you'll see that they fall into those buckets of non-monetary solutions as well as monetary solutions. And we tried to identify whether it was an initiative that needed to be led by the legislature, um, the administration, and in some cases, particularly around the licensing issues, the Office of Professional Regulation. Uh, so the first is entering the Interstate Nurse Licensure Compact. Um, that movement is already uh, underway at the legislature. Changing the clinical faculty requirements, and this gets to the nurse educator challenge that um, we discussed. The Office of Professional Regulation has just recently submitted a report to the legislature um, agreeing that we need to make some changes to allow um, a greater pool of, of nurses to perform the services of clinical nurse faculty. Create a pathway for military medics to LPN. Uh, the legislature uh, put in place a direct pathway for licensed nurse aides, or for a military medic to licensed nurse aides two years ago. This would expand upon that effort. Uh, removing statutory barriers to physician assistant employment, aligning mental health cl clinician licensing requirements, <coughs> Um, accepting certain licenses as immediate pathways to licensure of dentists, exploring licensing pathways for foreign dentists and foreign physicians, and then exploring the possibility of joining the psychology interjurisdictional compact, which is similar to the interstate nurse compact. So those are some of the non-monetary, more regulatory type um, changes that we think would at least help. It's a tool in the toolbox to try to bring more folks into this pipeline. Higher education reforms, uh, lower the minimum age of admission for the LPM program, which is currently 18. The idea here is if we could lower that uh, entry level age uh, to 17, then um, students could take advantage of at least the prerequisite courses in their senior year in high school as part of the dual enrollment program, which would really cut down on the cost um, of obtaining the, the LPN certification. Reopen the UVM Psychiatric Mental Health Nurse Practitioner Program, which is something that um, UVM had proposed to do a couple of years ago. It was a, um, an appropriation issue. Expand apprenticeship programs for non-degree allied health careers. Uh, the Department of Labor currently has apprenticeship programs, and so we'd like to work with them to expand those to areas where we feel that there's greatest need. And then on the financial side, increasing scholarship funding and loan repayment funding. Uh, our loan repayment program has been relatively level funded um, for the last seven or eight years. It's just under a million dollars. Um, New Hampshire, for example, just appropriated $6.5 million to its loan repayment program. When you look at our nursing shortage in particular, um, over the last handful of years, we've only been able to support 57 nurses through our current loan repayment program. So the task force felt pretty strongly that we needed to, to boost that funding. And then the task force agreed that there were a number of tax incentives that we would like the legislature to consider uh, to promote um, healthcare workforce in our state, Maine, our nearest neighbor in the oldest state is doing some pretty innovative things when it comes to their opportunity tax credit program, which is, is much more broad based than the healthcare sector. Um, but we felt like we needed to do something here to attract folks um, into Vermont and to stay in Vermont. They also have in Maine a rural practitioner healthcare credit. Oregon has <laughs> similar programs. So we're asking our legislature to take a look at some of those ideas. Continuing on, telehealth, uh, which we'll talk about, uh, was a again a cross-cutting issue, and we see maximizing telehealth opportunities as a way to help us deal with the with the stress and strain of not having enough bodies to provide these service uh, in every location that we'd like them to be at every minute of every day, uh, and then reducing administrative burden obviously rose to um, the top of the pile because of this provider burnout challenge that we're facing. So there are a number of recommendations here around streamlining quality measures, reducing and eliminating prior authorizations, and then recognizing um, 
some of the, the real challenges around having an adequate um, mental health workforce and substance abuse workforce, really looking at the Medicare credentialing restrictions and seeing if we can um, adjust those so that we can have greater access to those services across our continuum. And then increasing state recruitment efforts, um, establishing a state-led immigration and new American initiative to try to connect healthcare providers with this population, establishing a statewide marketing campaign, uh, assuming <laughs> that we can do some innovative things, not just around licensing, but also on those tax incentive and financial incentive ideas that we've put out there to really market Vermont as a place where folks want to come, get their education, and stay, live, and work. And then asking the, the administration to prioritize healthcare on the Vermont Workforce Development Board, which looks at workforce development across the state, across the economy, and in um, all sectors. We also tried to identify what the federal issues are, and we've already begun um, conversations with our federal delegation on these issues which is trying to find a way to maximize um, National Health Service Corps and Nurse Corps program funding. Um, really having a, a better <laughs> approach to implementing the Public Service Loan Forgiveness Program. I'm sure you've heard a lot about how people thought they were eligible um, to have their loans forgiven because they'd entered in, into public service. We need a more robust um, effort so that folks understand what those requirements are and how to access those programs because there are people who would benefit from that, certainly in our state. Um, we've asked the delegation to um, increase the federal share of our state uh, loan repayment program funding, and then raise the H-2B cap to alleviate shortages. So the H-2B visa program is the program where most nurses um, would enter the state and be able to work. There's a cap, a federal cap on the amount uh, or the number of folks who could enter, and it's a national cap. Um, so there's a lot of activity uh, in Washington, um, a lot of provider organizations at the national level asking for that cap to be um, increased, which would help with the flow of folks. Does the national in. cap get allocated out to the states, or how does that work? There, yeah, that's my understanding is that there is, um, there is an allocation. Um, and so we've been talking with our congressional delegation on how to maybe address that for rural, rural states. So those are our workforce recommendations. Again, I really uh, encourage you to, to take a, a look at the report. And we certainly appreciate the board's um, attention to this really important issue. to the section of the report that uh, really documents some of our efforts to look at uh, revenue and expense issues across the sectors. As I said earlier, we didn't get uh, as deep into this area as we had hoped due to data limitations. Uh, but what really what, we're, what we started trying to do in this area was to bring things down closer to a sector or entity level because when you're looking at financial sustainability as we see, for example, in our regulatory process with hospitals, you, you need to look at it in terms of operating expenses and uh, revenue sources. And so this slide is, is really showing that there, for many of the sectors, there are issues with operating expenses growing faster than revenues. Um, and as Laura mentioned, in the workforce area, reimbursement rates not covering uh, inflation or personnel cost increases. And so this slide just basically provide some examples of pressures on the operating expense side and pressures on the revenue side um, as an example of what we were hoping to be able to, at the level that we were hoping to get to, but did not. So this next slide has a lot of words on it, but this is one that we can probably breeze through pretty quickly because of the work that the Green Mountain Care Board does. You're familiar with these topics, this is about the financial health metrics that we were measuring. Um, but before talking about the financial health metrics, a little bit about the task force process. Um, if you recall that slide that showed the, the reporting um, channels from entity to agency, we were trying to collect financial data from those agencies that are collecting 
collecting the data. Um, the task force got together to set some background. They invited the Green Mountain Care Board Hospital budget staff to come in, and um, um, member Yusufer was there to talk about how the Green Mountain Care Board um, looks at the financial health metrics of the hospitals, and which ones of those could then be used by the task force that would apply to all the health, health sectors. Um, so the task force members got together and they narrowed a, a large list down to a smaller list, and even from that smaller list of financial health metrics, selected the, the three that are up on the screen, which is um, margins, operating margin and total margin, days cash on hand, and payer mix. Um, we put together a financial um, workbook that had more than just those three metrics on it, it had several metrics on it, and sent it out to the agencies that collect the information. We did receive most of those workbooks back, most of those workbooks back, some of them were more complete than others, and the information that we have, we tried to analyze and aggregate into the slides that um, are in the deck. We're not going to go through each one of the sectors individually. Each sector does have a profile slide, so to speak, in the next few slides. Um, so we won't spend time on each individual sector, but those profile pages really are meant to do what Robin was talking about, which is to look at an entity level. So um, system-wide looks are great. You, know, you can look at the hospital system and see what the average operating margin is, but you really need to look at the 14 different entities to see what the financial sustainability of those institutions are. Um, so quickly, I touched on some of the limitations of the data, um, um, but I'll get the ones I've missed, which are that financial years may be different. For example, for home health agencies, they're not all reporting on the same, the same year, um, fiscal year or calendar year. Um, not all of the um, agencies were able to provide audited financial statements, and audited financial statements are preferred because those are the ones that have been through the aud their auditors. Um, we couldn't get data for all the sectors, and we only asked for the, the most recent three years of data. So three years of data is a great start to looking at trends, but three years of data is not a trend in and of itself. Um, and then lastly, which Robin mentioned, is the system-wide analysis, which is useful to look at in terms of how's the sector doing, but you really do need to do a deeper dive by the entity level. Anything you add? The only thing I would add is, um, you'll, and you'll see this but as we go through the different pieces, we weren't always able to show a range. So when we talk, for example, about the day's cash on hand slide, we have the average. That doesn't show you the variability. So it's important to remember that even in the data that we're going to show, there's more under the hood than what you can see in the slide. So I'll spend a little time on the next two slides, and then I'll breeze through the rest um, in this section. This shows payer mix. and. We know that payer mix is important because it shows the percentage of revenue coming from each of the payer, whether it be commercial, government, self-pay. Um, and you can see, so there, here's hospitals, home health and hospice, nursing homes, FQHCs, and designated and, and specialty service agencies. There's variability in where their, where their payers are, the, the amount of money that's coming in from each of the payers. Um, so for the hospitals, it's worth noting that this information is coming from the Green Mountain Care Board regulatory process. So these are the 14 hospitals that report to us. This does not include the Broadboro Retreat. Whereas earlier the slide that Laura showed about um, the, the travelers, that did include information from the Broadboro Retreat. Um, and we were not able to get information on paramix from independent providers and substance use preferred providers. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, I just wanted to comment that payer mix is also pretty, um, can be, have some variation within sectors, and particularly if you have a, a really large organization, such as one large hospital, that will, um, their payer mix will sort of influence everybody else's, um, so, uh, we, and we certainly see variation in the home health industry too, uh, in terms of payer mix, depending on the location, the more rural places tend to be more Medicaid. Thank you, Jill. Yes, Jill, and that, that sentiment is exactly true for days cash on hand. So for using um, designated agencies as an example, they had an FY18, um, although their average was um, 51 days cash on hand, the minimum that year was a designated agency that had eight days cash on hand, and the maximum was a designated agency that had had 102 days cash on hand. So you can see there's a big difference between eight days and 102 days. Um, 
So on Days Cash on Hand, we, we did display a multi-year look um, from 2016, 17, and 18. And this was one where we had limited data. We weren't able to collect days, on, days Cash on Hand from all the healthcare sectors, but we are able to post the ones that are on the screen. So um, I said I was gonna breeze through these sectors, um, the profile by sector. And I'm just gonna pause for a second to show here so that you know how to use these slides. Um, using home health as an example, we try to profile um, one of the financial health metrics that does show the difference in the entities. So using home health as an example, this is showing operating margin. So here is the percentage of operating margin from positive all the way down to negative. And then this axis here is showing the 10 agents, um, home health agencies in Vermont that reported. So we try to, on each healthcare sector, profile an entity level look. Um, we also, on each one of the slides, show the day's cash on hand, the payer mix, and, any, and highlighting any sort of limitation to the data. Since we're on home health, do you have anything else you want to add, Jeff? Uh, no, I actually think you covered it well. <laughs> Great. So, so yeah. who's the agency that has over 10%? Uh, uh, so I actually, my members are pretty sensitive about talking about who's where, but I will tell you that some of the variation comes from decisions about how much to invest and how much to keep in cash. And so it's actually can be a little bit hard to, um, to make sense just looking at the dots without understanding that those deeper questions, there are agencies that are actually pretty similarly uh, positioned and it's really good a choice about investment. So um, we have a profile for the FQHCs, profile for the designated specialty service agencies, and thank you to Sandy and Heidi for all your help with that. Um, they came and presented to the task force a very nice presentation on the financial assessment of the designated and specialty agencies. Um, we have a profile on the long-term care facilities, independent providers, and the free clinics. If I could just make a quick note about independent providers and free clinics. So, uh, the reporting that independent providers do is related uh, to those who are at part of the blueprint and do the reporting that is required to be a blueprint practice. So uh, on the independent providers, we looked for external sources to provide information about the financial situation. So it looks quite different from the other sectors because of the information that we had available. Similarly, with free clinics, uh, free clinics, of course, you don't get reimbursed uh, from payers because people are usually going there because they either can't afford uh, their deductible or they uh, are uninsured. And so this slide will also look a little bit different, but try to provide sort of relevant information about that sector. Yes. And just commenting on, this is the nursing home slide. Um, so the division of rate setting within DIVA collects uh, Medicare and Medicaid cost reports, audited financial statements, payroll-based um, journals, and a lot of other information. Um, they did not put it really in the context of some of the others um, that I know Robin asked for, but um, I think it's in large measure because we just spent last year going through a task force process on nursing homes, including financial sustainability, and a lot of that work was done then. But just so you know, that that data is collected and analyzed uh, within DIVA. Yeah, actually, that's it's similarly for home health. Um, the data that's collected by Dale is on a state fiscal year basis and is unaudited but our audited financials are also submitted to DIVA for a separate purpose, which is for our provider tax. It's part of why we have some concerns about that Dale data, because it's not audited and it's really off the right fiscal year. Okay. Um, we are definitely not gonna go over the hospital slide because you've all seen this information before in the hospital budget process, but I did wanna spend a little bit of time just touching on uh, the issue of hospital closures. Uh, one of the specific charges in the legislation was for the task force to look at the potential consequences of the failure of one or more rural hospitals in Vermont. Uh, I think is 
we all know uh, hospitals provide critical services to patients as well as other uh, healthcare organizations and um, the, all of the sectors in a particular community do need to work together to, for the care of their patients. Um, what we found when we did research on uh, the closure, hospital closure financial impacts um, was that there are two areas that that's been analyzed. So this, this is data based on what we could find in our research um, that's out there. And in, uh, it's largely not Vermont specific. So it's, uh, it's the studies that we were able to define on a more national level. So uh, the, when a, a hospital closes, there's an economic impact due to the hospital being an employer and also a purchaser of, of services. Um, in one of the studies we looked at in Northern New England, healthcare workers were about 10% of each state's workforce and uh, the closure of a community's sole hospital is estimated to reduce per capita income in that community by 4% and increase unemployment by 1.6%. So uh, what that really is looking at is um, hosp acute care hospitals, just to be clear, uh, it, it's acute care hospitals where there is one hospital in the community. So that's very similar to, I pulled those statistics out of the that I could find out because that's similar to the way Vermont's hospital system is structured where we typically have uh, one hospital per county. Uh, the statistics are different for counties and other states where there's more than one hospital in the county. So um, I tried to pull out what I thought was the most relevant. And I'm not gonna go through all of the statistics because I, you can read as well as I can. I'm just gonna highlight a few things. Um, also, when uh, an acute care hospital in a county closes, again, when it's the sole hospital, uh, there's a little bit less than a 20% decline in the physician supply, which also includes primary care. So it's not just general surgery, for example. And I think that's no surprise to us looking at um, how much primary care is provided in, uh, by uh, Vermont's hospital. We give an example of maternity care as a reduction in service, uh, largely because that was what we were able to find in the study. So I, again, I'm not gonna go through all the details, but it gives you some examples of what is going on uh, there. And uh, I just also wanted to note that one of the, in the federal bipartisan policy centers report, they have a section on right sizing of care. And so I think it's important to acknowledge that Aligning services is complicated, and trying to figure out what right sizing means when you have a declining population and an aging population <coughs> is hard. Um, and that there's also impacts on access and travel times, outcomes, and community preferences. So uh, that's not an easy analysis to do. We did not attempt to tackle that uh, in this section of the report. <coughs> um, and then lastly, I think it's important to recognize um, in this section that uh, for our hospitals, they are in the middle of a payment reform where, which at least theoretically could provide more revenue stability over time, but we are really on the <coughs> shaky bridge that Eric Schell talked about where uh, not enough of the revenue is in the fixed perspective payments to provide that stability and, and they're really trying to span and manage to uh, both a fee-for-service environment and a fixed perspective payment, which of course uh, is both of those systems are meant to drive different behavior. So we just wanted to acknowledge that that's firmly where we are right now in our evolution. So turning back to the task force um, discussion, uh, we do not have consensus recommendations in this area. What we basically decided is that in, in looking what data we had, that there, there really was not the ability with the data available and with the time available to do, as I said before, a real uh, deep dive on the financial sustainability of each sector. And certainly um, there are priorities that are used by both our legislature and the administration to allocate state funding among the sectors uh, that largely has not focused on sustainability of, of the particular sector in the past. It's really focused more on community needs, other uh, pressures, a, a variety of factors. So 
uh, we wanted to acknowledge that, but basically indicate that we felt like it made more sense for the task force to focus on the other areas where we had the ability to find areas of consensus across all the sectors um, rather than offer non-consensus recommendations in this sector. But, uh, but nobody thinks they don't need more money. That is true. <laughs> Just to be clear. They, they, so that's the slide. Uh, the task force did identify two broad areas um, around sustainability, as Jill mentioned, targeted increases in reimbursements and reduction in, in administrative burden to the provider burnout and uh, other issues. So, um, so the way we've structured this section is to include two slides which have examples that were submitted by each sector with an example of either a targeted increase or an, a reduction in administra administrative burden that that particular person representing that sector thought would be helpful. They, again, are not consensus. They were not, people did not, were not asked to discuss or debate or agree on those. They're simply, each person is saying, this is what our sector thinks would help us in these two areas. Um, I did want to note that in the national conversation, there is a real focus on telehealth and moving from fee-for-service to value-based payment as a way for rural providers to weather national pressures, increase revenue stability, and improve value. So I think that is also worth noting that Vermont is on a journey, uh, particularly trying to move towards the value-based payment. Um, so I'm not going to go through all of the details of these slides. I think uh, people can read the examples. I did want to note on administrative burden that the independent providers' suggestions on reducing administrative burden are included in the <coughs> consensus recommendations related to workforce. So you don't see them represented here, but that's, that's why. And these are all different from the consensus administrative burden recommendations. Okay. okay. Oh, finally, I have the floor. It's a long way to wait to slide 53. Um, so. Jim and I had the same problem. We had the problem with staying silent. Yes. Um, so care coordination. So this was uh, absolutely one of the topics that we talked about. I think in some ways uh, we, we came up with fewer recommendations, I think you'll see, in part because there's a lot of work already happening in the, the provider space on care coordination much of which has been driven by various policy changes like payment reform, but the, the, there aren't as many, I, I think, policy recommendations to, to make uh, as, as we've been going through this evolution. Let's see. Okay, so I call this the Spirograph chart, um, and it is, am I the only one who remembers Spirograph? Yeah. Okay. okay. Um, <laughs> So this is really a, a sort of a visualization of uh, all the different connections that there are between the various provider types who are providing services um, and uh, support to folks in, I think this is from a particular community from Bennington. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, so uh, you know what I, what I think all of this says is that really what we're trying to do as providers is work together to make sure that people are getting the right care in the right place and that um, that core role of home and community-based services as a coordinator, particularly for services that impact health but aren't health care, is really strong and was strong before we started health care reform. So I feel like that was really a theme that, that we heard a lot, that care coordination is something we're talking about a lot in the health care reform conversations, but it's not a new idea. Um, and in fact, um, one of the things that uh, you'll see on that, that last bullet on the slide is that in many ways, <coughs> initiatives like the Blueprint or like the, the One Care Vermont work are really ways to increase our effectiveness and efficiency in doing that care coordination and providing tools, at least in theory, that's sort of what we're hoping for, not so much the, the idea or the need for us to talk to each other. I think that, that part is, is well known um, among providers. <coughs> Um, so we identified um, various issues that I, I would say are pretty consistent with other meetings that we all go to where we talk about care, things that are related to care coordination. So um, uh, one is really making sure that we find a way to invest in that coordination work. Some of it is not really reimbursable necessarily in the old environment and so that's really important to try to find a way to, to make that possible. Um, 
we have this bullet that I, I think is really right on, which is that the transition in payment and delivery reform is both too fast and too slow. So in some ways, I think for providers who are trying to change how they are paid, it feels pretty fast and pretty scary. For those of us who are hoping that those changes will drive some real change in delivery reform and what um, uh, an entity like a hospital might want to invest in in the community, it feels slow. And so it kind of depends on your lens and your perspective. Uh, about about how it's feeling. Um, there are some real limitations. Uh, this is where telehealth comes in, where there's actually quite a bit of telehealth that lots of providers think would be really beneficial and improve our coordination, and also improve our, as we've said, our workforce issues, and yet that's not reimbursable under most payers. So there's some real payer payment barriers to um, to providing those services. and. You know, it really would be great for people to have to move around less to get their care and also for the providers to, to be able to access places that are rural and far away, um, even uh, with their, you know, their critical expertise. Um, so we also talked about the uh, a, a more evolution on the, the data tools or the technology tools that, that we're working with as especially community providers on care coordination. Um, there, it's been talked about a lot, but there are some real barriers. Um, the, you know, the, the thing that I hear about the most and that we talked about is there's no integration with electronic health records right now. And so for most providers who were trying to now talk to each other in a new electronic way through Care Navigator about care coordination, there's double data entry. People are working through their medical records and they're working through Care Navigator. And so that's something that I think everyone is well aware of as a barrier and a concern, um, but it's, it's definitely a complex problem to solve. Um, we also talked about the variation in how the care management work is happening in different communities and this tension that we always have, we see it in the blueprint, between sort of local control or sort of local realities and then the need for there to be some standardization and consistency. So I would say I've seen that tension through the whole implementation of the blueprint that's been over the last, I don't know, like decade plus. Yeah, um, and then that has sort of carried into the, the work that we're doing uh, today. We also identified that there's some coordination that providers would love to do, but it's illegal. And that's a, um, an ongoing concern that, you know, that came up when the Affordable Care Act was passed, where there's this tension between how the sort of Justice Department um, type folks think about these issues and how providers think about the issues and the, the barriers are, are real. Um, uh, certainly reimbursement um, uh, limits for uh, some of the, this kind of coordination work. And then, um, and then another piece, which is that we don't have enough people necessarily to take care of everybody. And so it's really hard to find enough people to, to also coordinate the care of everybody when that person might actually be able to provide a direct service. <coughs> So that, uh, that can be really challenging as well. Um, these are some really great examples of success that I'm not going to read to you. Uh, I'll let you take a look at those, but a couple of things I wanted to just uh, note. These are very human heavy initiatives. So they, they are really focused on real people, real providers, community health workers, other types of folks having relationships with people with complex needs and really assisting them in a pretty deep way. And that that's really the work that's required to reduce emergency department visits and hospitalizations, which is what you see carried out through most of these initiatives as a, as a sort of outcome. But to me, what I was struck by as I read through these was how much interaction, live interaction between real people and, and the folks they're trying to serve, um, and how important that is. And I don't think we're gonna get away from that. It's always, behavior change is really complex, and people have some pretty challenging um, you know, life circumstances that, that take quite a bit of effort to, to work through. Uh, so, some themes, and you're gonna see these carried forward in the recommendation. Um, uh, there's a broad continuum of care coordination providers. Um, there's more work to do to develop and mature our care models. And then one other thing that we, that we talked about and that, that I definitely feel is important is that we've spent a lot of time focusing on primary care 
as a critical service, and it is a critical service, what, where we need to go next, I think, is, um, and actually we should probably change that but to an and, right? Isn't that the way you're supposed to do it? Um, <laughs> um, but, and, um, there are other places where primary care is essentially happening and where primary <coughs> care can be extended. So, uh, into the home, uh, into nursing home, <coughs> using telehealth. Um, so there is, I, I think, we, we just need to sort of think more broadly about what we mean when we say primary care, because if we mean office visits, that's pretty limiting. Um, then we talked about how designated agencies, other community providers are um, already doing a lot of care coordination, but we've got those workforce vacancies we talked about. Um, there, for some smaller independent practices, some of those models are requiring some infrastructure that they may just not have in those practices. And then, um, and then the last thing is there's, um, and I, this is definitely a theme that I hear among the home and, com home and community based providers is, we want to make sure as we change these models and, and do our innovation that we look first to the provider community that already is providing some type of service before we start building new things. And um, I think that's a little bit challenging in some ways, partly because uh, an entity like a hospital might be used to a home health agency saying no on certain things because they're not covered by Medicare. And to remember that we've actually got this incredible capacity in designated agencies in home health to do work that might not be currently reimbursable, but that we could do with some with some other changes. So I think that was the last uh, key theme. That's the, the last of it. Oh no, we keep going to the recommendations. So I'm not going to go through the recommendations um, because they. I actually have said almost everything that um, that that is in here. Um, the themes are pretty familiar. There are a few items to highlight. Um, we certainly highlighted the need for those delivery system reform. Um, dollars and efforts, I, do know, I know I don't need to explain that in this room. Um, and, uh, and then there was also at the end of the next slide, there's one about a, just aligning that reporting, the screening, the performance indicators, all that stuff that, um, that can really take a lot of time and effort. There's a lot more work to do to get that, those things lined up to, to make it more usable for uh, providers with less duplication. Thank you. last full section of the report um, before we get into the additional resources which we won't go over today um, and this was when we started off we talked about the three priorities and that one of the potential solutions to um, workforce care coordination and revenue stability is telehealth and we've heard it mentioned several times already today um, this section not only includes the recommendations but it's also sort of an educational piece because as we did the work in telehealth, it became um, apparent rather quickly that there is a lot of misinformation, um, old information about telehealth. So the, the task force section of the report is part recommendation, but part sort of educational reference. Um, so firstly, when people talk about telehealth, there's a lot of interchangeable words. And so this slide is meant to kind of capture those words. Um, and it's structured by talking about the three very common modalities, the ways that telehealth is delivered. So this first column is telemedicine, um, which is also referred to sometimes as synchronous telehealth. And synchronous means live. So this is the kind of telehealth that's happening in real time. Um, there's two ways that it's done. There's from provider to patient. Um, and the, the provider is at what is called an, um, um, a distance site, and the patient is at what's called an originating site. So these ter this terminology is important, especially when we talk about originating site, because depending on where the patient is and depending on where they get their health insurance, they might, may be eligible to receive telehealth services, they may not be able to receive telehealth services. And this conversation comes up a lot when you're talking about a patient's home or home-like setting, whether it's a nursing home or a hotel, wherever the patient calls home. Um, the second kind of synchronous, real live, or live um, telemedicine um, is video consult. So this is from provider to provider. So this is when one doctor is talking to another doctor, usually in an emergent type situation, like in an emergency room. So that's what is referred to as telemedicine, synchronous telemedicine. 
The second modality is called store and forward, often referred to as asynchronous, so this is not live. This is a passive transmission of information. It might be an image, but it could be text. It could be a question. Um, and this is also often referred to as an e-consult. Um, and there, there are going to be recommendations about store and forward. And then the last is remote patient monitoring, which is also referred to commonly as telemonitoring. So again, that relationship is provider to patient, where a patient can transmit um, health information to their provider from their home. Um, now, while telehealth definitely has been identified as a potential solution to some of these, these barriers that we've been discussing, the task force wanted to make it clear that um, it, is, it is not meant to substitute um, the face-to-face -face interaction between a, a provider and their patient. It is meant to enhance that relationship. So this next slide basically takes what you saw on the first slide with icons and it gives a picture and an a, and a, um, example. So when we talked about um, telemedicine, synchronous live, being able to talk directly to your doctor, an example is telepsychiatry. So being able to call your psychiatrist from home or from a hotel room. Um, also in that first modality, the provider to provider consultation, telemergency. So if you're in an emergency room and the emergency room doctor is having a patient that's suffering from a stroke and needs to contact a neurologist, they can do that through telemergency. And we heard about this when we heard from Southwestern Vermont Medical Center. They were, uh, it seems to be a relatively robust telehealth um, program and they are using the telemergency services. Um, with Storing Forward, um, there'll be a recommendation here. Uh, if, if, you're talk, if you're in some of the circles that are talking about telehealth, you hear a lot about teledermatology, teleophthalmology. Those are the two forms of store and, for, store and forward that are available, at least under um, Medicaid in Vermont. So this is um, an example of taking a picture of something that could be an issue, sending it from a provider to another provider, a primary care provider, for example, to a specialist and asking, do you think this person needs to come see you, or do you think this, this is something that can be handled by, by us, or will this go away? And then the last example is the remote, remote patient monitoring. Um, so this is a patient at home can take their own vitals, their own blood pressure, and send it to their provider. So um, I just wanted to put up here these FAQs about telehealth in Vermont. These questions came up a lot as we were kind of researching the topic. Um, how is telehealth handled here in Vermont? So it's important to note that there is pay parity in Vermont for approved telehealth services. In other words, if I'm going to the doctor to receive um, a service in person and it's covered by my insurance, then I can also get that service through tele telehealth. It doesn't mean there's pay parity, but there's um, coverage pay parity. Um, the service must be clinically appropriate and within the provider's license scope of practice just like it would be if it was person to person. Uh, the patient must consent to the visit being done through telemedicine. And there's a, there's a consent form that needs to be filled out. Um, this consent can be bypassed if it's an emergency. Um, prescriptions can be prescribed through a televisit. And um, telehealth consultations are not recorded. That question came up actually quite a bit, is whether or not they're recorded and they're not recorded. But why are we even talking about telehealth? Um, the reason is because telehealth, there's lots of research that shows that telehealth, and we've heard it from the different sectors, that it can have a substantial impact in rural communities. Um, it can mitigate access issues, specifically ones that are related to wait times. Telehealth saves time for the patient in terms of traveling to the doctor's office, um, having to hire a babysitter to go to the doctor's office, having to take time off from work to go to the doctor's office, but it also saves time for the provider. Um, they, if, a, if a patient can forego seeing a specialist, for example, through e-consult, the, dermatolo the dermatologist <coughs> looks at the picture and says, no, they don't need to come see me, well, then they just save time to see a patient who has a more complex, a more complex case. So um, it helps save time on both the patient side and the provider time. Um, but essentially, the reason we're talking about this is because it supports these three priority areas. In some of the research, it shows that some effective telehealth programs for rural communities are chronic care management, intervention, emergency care, home monitoring, intensive care units, long-term care, 
psychotherapy and remote counseling and interpreter services. So we don't have a lot of information about how telehealth has impacted Vermont. We, we can read the studies. Um, we do have, but we do have a little bit, we have pockets of information about tele how telehealth is working in Vermont. Um, so this map, this chart shows information that's coming to us from the University of Vermont uh, Medical Center. Um, and they have recently really beefed up their telehealth department. Um, and the head of their department, Todd Young, took a lot of time to meet with me and some of the members of the task force and the hospital budget team to talk about not only how they're doing telehealth at the, at the medical center, but about how it could and should work in Vermont. Um, this map here is showing the regional impact. So of course this is sending into New York because this is the network. And um, it's showing where the patients were living when they received their um, televisit. So you can see how big that map is. So these are all patients that are receiving services from the University of Vermont Medical Center. And to sort of kind of calculate one lens of looking at the impact of this is through the savings in time. Um, they evaluated 561 video visits in 2018. Um, and they, this medical center assessed that they saved 47,000 driving miles for the patient and 1,000 hours of driving time, which translates to about 6.6 .6 tons of carbon emissions. So that's one way of looking at the impact. And of course, the next question is, well, what is the, what's the financial impact? What's the access to care impact? And those sorts of analyses are still happening. Um, um, right now, the, my understanding is that the network is focused on just getting telehealth integrated into their services. And with that, they'll start to track this information. Uh, we asked them about the no-show rate, um, trying to get at the access, the access issue, and they did say that for um, for specialty visits in person, there's about a 30% no-show rate. So this is you're going to see your specialist, you've been on the wait list for four months, your appointment comes up, and 30% of people don't show up. Whereas with a telehealth visit for specialty care, the no-show rate is 2%. And when those 2% don't, don't show up, they have a process by which they try to figure out why they didn't show up. Was it a technology issue? Was it a scheduling conflict? What was it? So it's, you know, I think there's an argument to be made there in terms of access and using everyone's time efficiently. But there are limitations to how um, telehealth is implemented in Vermont. And when we spoke with various um, people, um, providers, stakeholders, policy, people, the barriers are um, um, who can be paid to deliver telehealth services, what services can be reimbursed, what technology can be used, and how can a provider best incorporate telehealth into their regular workflow. And in kind of teasing these out, it became clear that a lot of these are about information. It's about having the right information, timely information, and sort of um, dispelling some, some maybe misinformation about telehealth services. We can't talk about telehealth without talking about broadband limitations. Um, this is what will particularly affect the remote patient monitoring or modality of telehealth where people are using um, the services from their home. So this um, timeline kind of shows progress as of 2014, um, progress that's been made to expand telehealth. We've been chipping away at um, making telehealth more available, reimbursable. Um, when you see a green, a green cell, that means that it was a state of Vermont initiative, and when you see a blue cell, that means that it was a federal initiative. But between federal and state initiatives, we're starting to chip away. Um, the holdout, as is most always the case, is Medicare. Medicare is the one where um, a patient cannot receive services from home. Um, we're starting to chip away at that with the Medi Medicare Advantage. Starting in this year, Medicare Advantage members will be able to get services from home and through the all-payer model. Um, when we talk about the telehealth wa waiver under the all-payer model, um, it does two big things. One is that um, Medicare patients who are attributed can receive services from home. And the second, and, and actually have this on the next slide, but I'll say it now, is um, there's something called a health professional shortage area. It's a, desig it's a federal designation. Um, it happens all over the country, but in Vermont, there are parts of Vermont that are identified as a health professional shortage area. And what's surprising is that it's not all of Vermont. 
Um, in fact, there are big pockets that aren't considered this health professional shortage area. And unless you live in a health professional shortage area, you aren't eligible to receive the telehealth services. But under the all-payer model, that designation um, is waived. So this um, chart is labeled draft, and it probably always will be, because it is very much a work in progress. We can't figure it out. <laughs> and I will just say, I encourage anybody who has um, suggestions or corrections to this chart, or if you know of people who might be able to help us develop this chart, please do forward this along and ask them to contact us. But this chart was trying to address the, those first limitations where who can, um, who can provide telehealth services and, and what services are reimbursed. <coughs> well, this chart is trying to get at that. <coughs> the columns are payers. So there's commercial, Medicaid, Medicare, Medicare Advantage, and then the all-payer model. <coughs> and then the, col um, the rows are the biggest kind of barriers to telehealth. The first being whether or not a patient's home is an approved site. The second is that health professional shortage area I was talking about. The third is who's a qualified provider um, who can give the services. And the fourth row is about store and forward. The fifth about remote patient monitoring. And then the last is just a catch all for other limitations. So I'm not gonna go through the details of this, but just basically how you would use this is, um, if for example, if you're worried, if you were interested in how commercial reimburses for Medicare for um, telehealth, you could look down here and say, "Yep, I can be at home." Uh, or it depends on your on your who's give, providing your insurance, but but yes, and yes, um, um, I, it does extend beyond the health professional shortage area. I could live in a place that's not an HPSA and still receive the services. One thing I will note here, down on the on the bottom line, is for um, FQHCs. Um, and this is kind of a special problem for FQHCs, is that Medicare does not reimburse FQHCs as a distant site, period. So if an FQHC provider is having a, a, a video visit with one of their patients, that is not a reimbursable event. Um, this is the last page before we get to the recommendations, and it's the second to last page of the presentation. Um, <laughs> So before talking about the recommendations, first I wanted to talk about the um, expansion initiatives that are already underway. On a federal level, CMS is doing some things and Congress is doing, maybe doing some things to chip away at the Medicare stronghold, to chip away so that Medicare looks a little bit more like Medicaid. Um, um, for store and forward, um, the this, this state is, sorry, I have, I have a very small type here. Um, this is about teledentistry. So the Dental Access and Reimbursement Working Group um, published their report in November, and there was um, um, a signal there that when the Department of Health presents their budget to the legislature this year, so in the coming weeks, they will have a recommendation on teledentistry. One of the sort of low-hanging fruit, so to speak, is on store and forward. Right now in Vermont, store and forward is limited to teledermatology and teleophthalmology, and sort of a, a next natural step would be to extend that to teledentistry. We have recommendations that go even beyond teledentistry, but that would be a next natural step. I did forget to say when I was on this chart that the recommendations that you're about to see basically are just like the extension of this. There's been a lot of work that's been done to expand um, reimbursement for telehealth, and the recommendations are basically just continuing the timeline. Um, and then in terms of planning initiatives, the um, EPQHC, the Vermont Program for Quality and Healthcare, has convened a group of stakeholders. Um, it's a very large group. There's about 30 people that um, attend, and I'm, I would even go as far as to say as regularly attend these meetings to talk about best practices, to talk about planning, to talk about implementation, and it's a diverse group, providers, policymakers, and really just kind of a special thank you to Hillary Wolfley and Kathleen Fulton for their work on that. They do this at, um, at the PQHC under funding from their 9416 contract statutory funding, which is, which is limited funding. So um, they're doing this uh, on, a, on, a, on, on a funding source that's limited. The last thing to add before I move on to the recommendations. Um, so the recommendations, there's there's four of them basically. 
the first is for store and forward e-consults um, to expand it, expand this beyond the teledermatology and the teleophthalmology. Um, the bullet points sort of recommend, or think of them as like tiers of expansion. So the first would be low hanging fruit to expand this to tele teledentistry. Ultimately, um, the goal would be in the, in the second and third bullets, which is to um, extend store and forward e-consults to um, services between primary care and specialty care. So anytime a primary care doctor needs to consult with a specialty care doctor, to have that be allowable if it's clinically appropriate. Um, and then the third bullet point um, is to expand reimbursement from Medicaid and commercial insurers to align with Medicare and reimbursement. And I always have to read this one to myself three times because <laughs> Medicare is typically the holdout when it comes to telehealth, except when it comes to e-consults. When it comes to e-consults, it's allowable. Um, and so the goal would be to bring Medicare up to speed with Medicare. Medicaid. Oh, I'm sorry, Medicare. <laughs> That's why I always have to read three times. <laughs> Um, the next um, topic is remote patient monitoring. So again, the bullet points are basically like tiers of expansion. Um, so the goal here would be to expand Medicaid co coverage beyond congestive heart failure. I haven't talked about this much, but um, under Medicaid in Vermont, uh, a patient is only eligible to receive remote patient monitoring at home if they've been diagnosed with congestive heart failure. And we asked why, why is that? Why is it limited to that? And there really is no good reason, and not because of lack of information, but it's, it's most likely because it's just ready to be updated. Um, some examples from other states are that they allow remote patient monitoring for anything that's clinically appropriate. Um, allow remote patient mon um, monitoring for commonly accepted applications such as COPD, asthma, and diabetes. And then the third bullet point gives um, examples from other states, which are um, disease specific. The third recommendation is for the ACO waiver to ensure that ACO telehealth waiver supports primary care and mental health at skilled nursing facilities. And that word ensure is really what's important because there's just a lack of clarity on whether these services are available under the, um, the ACO waiver. And then the last recommendation is on funding, which you can see checks all the boxes, action by the legislature, action by administration, action by the all payer model, action by private payers, action by federal. Everybody and anybody who wants to contribute funding towards grants for telehealth planning and for um, programs. So that covers the three priority areas in telehealth. Any questions? It felt like we relived six months. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sure it felt like <laughs> um, We're not going to walk you through the additional resources, but just wanted to tell you what's in there. Um, we have more definitions about telehealth because some of the recommendations would require new definitions being created in statute. Um, we have a section on related task force reports. We have the inventory, of course, a bibli bibliography of the articles and other materials that were circulated in the task force and that we used to create the report, and then a summary of the public comments. And of course, all of the information is posted on the um, task force website. Super. Are there questions from the board? Tom? <clears throat> a couple of things. First one is just to make sure I heard it right, I kind of was uh, for Laura. Um, the uh, slide 25. Yes, uh, the workforce bottlenecks and challenges. And I uh, wrote down next to student debt that you said that that was the number one concern. Um, and I'm just wondering, or it was the top concern, and I'm just wondering whether uh, this uh, inventory is kind of prioritized from top to bottom. Yeah, it is. Uh, when, you, when you look through the report, um, I'm just going to find the page in the actual report. <coughs> It is page four of the report. And those are really by priority, you know, just kind of identifying the things that we can't do anything about first, right? The tight national local labor market, the aging workforce. These are things we can't do much about. Um, provider burnout. And then when you start to get to what are some of the real barriers in terms of access to the, to the profession, we heard loud and clear across the state 
that the rising higher educational debt was a primary barrier. So, you know, in terms of things that we can actually tackle, um, that rose to the top of our recommendations. There's not necessarily any kind of metric no. or survey here, but it's no. just judgment in terms of, yeah. of, of, of what you've heard of. Correct. Um, the other is kind of like I'm kind of looking at the page three, just these uh, simple boiling down of the five questions the ledger act, legislature asks you to pursue, and you've given them a fire hose of information. I mean, this is um, really a kind of a wonderful document because I think everything is is in here, um, but you know, if I was a legislator, I, you know, I'd be sitting there saying, "Be careful what what we ask for, because we got so much that is it so much that we don't know what to do with it." And this is the end of a biennium. There's um, so what? What's your take on the uh, linkages with this report as it goes to the legislature um, and legislator leadership that can help? sift through this to sort through just the kind of priorities that Laura was just talking about. Where are things that the legislature can take action and how do you go through that sorting process with the committees to, to get as much out of it as you can by the end of the session? I'll speak of it from the workforce perspective then others certainly chime in. There is already underway significant activity on the workforce um, recommendations. The legislators have been paying attention to this for the last, the last six months. They've gotten drafts um, at the committee chair level. Um, so we already have um, bills that have been introduced around the Interstate Nurse Licensure Compact. They're already working on the clinical nurse faculty um, uh, credentialing challenges. They are fully aware um, of where we are with respect to recommendations around tax incentives. I think that certainly, um, as you know, uh, will be a robust conversation in the legislature. I think to the extent that we can look at some of the lower hanging fruit, we'll get some significant movement this year, recognizing that this really is a multi-year approach um, and that the workforce issue really, it's an economic development challenge that has a lot of larger issues that are certainly much bigger than this task force can take on that the legislature has they to deal with. Yeah, but I think just trying to highlight for them what we see as the areas that we would like them to focus on. Um, and really I would say what this has done over the last six months is raise awareness of this issue for the legislature and the critical importance that this workforce shortage um, you know, has with respect to our ability to afford <laughs> Uh, to, you know, to, to provide the services that, that Vermont is asking providers to provide. Um, it affects access. You can't admit patients if you don't have the staff available to meet those patient needs. So the ripple effects across the system, I think legislators are really starting to understand. But I think certainly on workforce, it's a multi-year <coughs> issue. So as I was uh, listening to us give this presentation, and this is the first time we've tried, um, I, I, here's one of my notes. Highlight items that legislature can do something about, because there's a lot in here that actually isn't a legislative uh, initiative, and so I, I think that as we, as we think about our different audiences, we need to maybe highlight. But I also just wanted to say I was really supportive of having this more detailed, full report, sort of white paper version on the workforce issues in particular because of the probable need for a multi-year focus on those issues. And so I thought it was important to have more of a document that we could hold on to, stand alone, start to, to work through. So I, I think you've raised a really good point that we're gonna need to address, but uh, uh, yeah, and we'll have to be thoughtful about that. And just a little more generally, what I would say is that what I, we've been scheduled in one committee so far, Health Healthcare next week, um, and, and to Jill's point, the task force met most recently yesterday, so uh, we did a quick turnaround to try and get this draft out, but we still need to do things like do a full proofread and finalize any typos or last minute errors before we submit uh, late, hopefully later this week. Uh, but I think what I've been trying to suggest to the committee chair that one approach they could take is let us do an overview so they kind of see the full scope of the work and then let's pick out the areas that they really want to do a deeper dive. Because I think um, we tried to kind of balance both of those approaches today. But I think for a committee, they really could take a very much higher level than we did today and then follow up and do, okay, today we're going to talk about workforce. Next week we're going to talk about telehealth or whatever. So I think that's an approach that um, 
that they could take that would really allow them to, to work through it in a more systematic fashion. Uh, first, you know, very comprehensive report, and obviously there's been a lot of work behind this. Um, a couple questions on, as you were going through this, were you able to identify maybe like the most vulnerable areas in the state, you know, because we know we're pretty rural throughout the whole state, and, and I um, like how you dealt with the Virginia County because a lot of people that are coming in there are from rural areas as well, but, you know, was there any prioritization or looking at, you know, areas that might be more vulnerable um, longer term? Yeah, I think uh, we do know, certainly from the demographic information, that the more rural uh, counties do tend to be older, so Northeast Kingdom, Bennington come to mind. Uh, but the task force did not prioritize the recommendations by geography, because the idea, I think, was that the policy change would benefit all geographic regions. Um, I don't know if, Laura, you had anything that came up related to, to that in workforce in your subgroup meetings. No, I think, um you know, I've spent the last two years actually going around the state talking with um, facilities in every pocket of the state. I think I've been to probably, between nursing homes and uh, residential care and assisted living, 50 different homes over the last two years. And I hear the same story no matter where I go. Obviously, you know, it is more of a challenge maybe in the Northeast Kingdom and in some other very, very rural parts of the state. And you have greater challenges around things like transportation in those areas and the ability of folks to get to work um, and to find childcare. So those are, I would say, are maybe um, more significant challenges in more rural areas. But the same story was told wherever I went, whether that was Burlington or, um, you know, Derby. So um, that's why I think we really tried to take it to a, how can we do this in a way that benefits everybody and benefits every sector, whether it's a designated agency, a home health agency, a nursing home, a hospital. Um, the, the unifying issue of workforce, I mean, this has been, I think, really an incredible process because it is truly the one thing that cuts across every single provider group, across every county in the state. Can I just say another follow-up? Next time you two are sitting next to each other. <laughs> <laughs> Make a note of that. Yeah. Um, the other thing I, I would just say about the geographic issue is that I think part of the reason why we didn't focus on that is that from on a policy level, um, for, and I'll just speak to the area that I know probably the best, which is Medicaid. I think it would be very difficult to target um, your policy recommendations by geography because there are sort of federal limitations in terms of having uniform rules across the same provider type. So there, I, that would get very complicated very quickly. And I think, you know, quite frankly, if, if the financial deep dive had resulted in a different <coughs> result and resulted differently, then maybe we'd have, we would have gone there. But it, it, kind of where we ended up, it didn't really make sense to And I think, you know, one of the areas that isn't really fully addressed right now is resource allocation, you know, kind of across within different areas of, of the state. Yes. And, you know, that's, that's probably a harder one to address. Um, and with that, you know, with just talking about like kind of consensus recommendations, and you obviously had a pretty wide uh, representation on the committee, which is great, but when you deal kind of with consensus, uh, sometimes that might limit some of the maybe tough topics because there's not consensus on things. And so I guess for the, maybe if there's something in the future, I mean, how do we overcome that because you know, that, that can be a barrier sometimes if you're dealing with consensus to, to move forward on some things that might be more controversial. Can I come back? Sure. Um, so one comment is that actually there, there actually wasn't that much trouble with it. it there was, we, we had very broad agreement on almost everything. The, the conflict was around the margins. If we had tried to maybe array which sector was in most need of more financial resources, that would have been impossible, and I don't think there's sort of any environment where that could be made to work. Um, but I think we agreed to sort of set that piece aside so that we could work on everything else. Um, 
but I don't really feel like it was hard to find consensus because the issues were so cross-cutting. Um, you know, I guess one area we can get a lot of is right, the financial metrics in general, and you know, we know looking at it, half the hospitals are in the red, and half the, um, the home health agencies that you showed in the hospice were losing money, and you know, we don't know the full financial pictures elsewhere, and it's just, you know, I guess the key there is, is time and how quickly are we going to be able to implement these things, whether it's between workforce or telemedicine, because you've certainly identified a lot of the key issues. It's just hard to solve, you know, it's not, not something that's going to solve quickly, and we're already losing money, you know, across the state in a lot of areas, so, you know, hopefully the infrastructure will be there when, when these things move forward. Yeah, no, I think, I think there are a lot of challenges. I did just want to make a comment that what you saw on those charts was operating margins, not total margins. And so many home health agencies actually have long-standing expectation that they'll have an operating loss, um, and they, they, they have been able to make it up on fundraising. That's getting harder. There's more and more organizations trying to do fundraising. Um, but I just want to clarify that um, it's, because it's actually really important, I think, for those agencies to be, um, it's important for them to be portrayed sort of appropriately in the public space because it's actually harder to raise money if people think you're falling apart. So that's where the sensitivity can, can come from. So, and that's actually always our challenge in advocacy is how do we describe the challenges we face and yet um, you know, make sure our communities know we're gonna be there for them. So that's, it's, really, it's a real tough balancing act. Okay, we should see how this moves forward. Yeah, yeah. thank you. Okay, at this point we'll open it up to the public for any comment. Seeing none, I want to thank you. It was a, a great afternoon. Um, and I know that it was a great six months for Team uh, Rural Health Task Force. So I'm going to move back to my chair and then. That would be um, good. Yeah. And we can carry on the meeting. Would anyone on the board wish to make a motion? I wish to make a motion. And Robin, you may want to abstain from this, I don't know. Happy to. Um, well, the Big Mountain Care Board has not studied the task force's recommendations in depth. We support exploring solutions focused on improving the recruitment and retention of the healthcare workforce, expanding access to telemedicine, and allowing care models to mature. The board understands that payment and delivery system reform is the path forward to financial sustainability and a retrenchment to fee-for-service payment is inconsistent with federal policy and will only result in greater financial distress for Vermont's health care providers and higher cost to Vermonters. Is there a second? There's a second. Is there any discussion? If not, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 And I will abstain. Let the record uh, show that it was a 3-0 vote with one abstention and one absence. I should, I should have probably, we should have probably let you know that in terms of the task force report, it was a, a unanimous vote of the members present. There were two absences and I abstained because the vote had not discussed it. <laughs> That probably was a, a sad vote, knowing that you lost a member of the task force just mm -hmm. recently. So yes, yeah, so we luckily had a, uh, we were able to substitute uh, Steve Meyer. So he he was the official de secondary designee for Tony Morgan, who did pass away, which was uh, a sad day. But we do want to recognize Tony for all the work that he's done over the years for the state of Vermont. So. Absolutely. Is there any old business to come before the board? Is there any new business to come before the board? Seeing none, is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. It's been moved and seconded to adjourn. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank you, everyone. Have a great rest of the day.